Thank you. Well, thank you, Paul, for that very generous introduction. And uh, good morning, delegates, sisters and brothers. I, I need to tell you that uh, Denise Specht, our Secretary Treasurer, and, and Paul, our Vice President, are also tireless advocates on your behalf and on students' behalf and work very hard. So let's give them a very warm welcome. But I want to start this morning by thanking you, all of you in this room and our 70,000 members across the state of Minnesota who make up Education Minnesota, for your inspiration that you give me and the dedication that you demonstrate every day for the students of Minnesota's public schools. Fellow members of Education Minnesota, today all of us in this room meet at a crossroads in our nation's history. The decisions that will be made in the next few months and years will shape the American landscape forever. The future of Education Minnesota, the future of all unions, and the future of America's middle class is in peril. Every generation arrives at such moments. In the early 1900s, America decided that women should have the right to vote. In the 1930s, America recognized that working people deserve fair wages and safe working conditions. In the 1960s, America proclaimed all people should be equal under law. In every defining moment in history, regular, everyday people rose up and made their mark. Today, it is our turn. Today, America is deciding whether working men and women deserve the right to keep speaking with a collective voice, to organize and bargain and participate in improving the conditions of their workplace. And we, as educators, right here in Minnesota, are in the very center of that national debate. I know many of us as educators would rather teach history than make it, but sometimes history does not offer us as participants a choice. It is no longer enough for us to only advocate for what's best for our students. We must now take up the cause of all working sisters and brothers because our voice is the strongest voice that is left to speak out for the rights of working people and for public schools. If there ever was a time for educators and nurses and firefighters and working people everywhere to come together to work together, to stick together, now is that time. As, <laughs> as Benjamin Franklin very famously said once, we must all hang together or surely we will all hang separately. The threats to the working class are real, but together we can overcome them and I guarantee we will. We are moving, we are acting, and we are speaking out, just like our sisters and brothers are doing right now in states all around the nation. I want to pause for a moment and publicly thank Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker. His attacks on Wisconsin's proud working people have done more to energize and organize, energize organized labor in this country than any other governor in my lifetime. Make no mistake, the struggles in Wisconsin and Ohio, in Michigan and in Indiana are not about money or government flexibility. The struggle is about protecting basic civil and human rights. It's about preserving democratic freedoms and workers' rights. I don't know how many of you have seen this photo. It's a demonstrator in Egypt holding up a sign that reads, Egypt supports Wisconsin workers. Even in the midst of forming a new democracy, Egyptians recognize the struggle in, their, in Wisconsin is their struggle too. In Egypt, the people rose up, threw off the tyranny of their oppressor because they want the rights that Americans already enjoy the rights that some people now want to take away from us. As a lifelong Minnesotan, I'm proud to say that today, all of us are Badgers and Buckeyes, Wolverines and Hoosiers. 
We are all in this struggle together. The situation in Minnesota is equally as dangerous. Some legislators are trying to eliminate workers' rights and doing it in the name of improving schools. They're using a we put kids first message to disguise their anti-union, anti-working family, anti-public education agenda. It is union busting masquerading as education reform, plain and simple. And so now in the halls of our state legislature, they are filled with proposals for new laws, more than a dozen at last count, that are designed to take away teachers' rights in the name of improving education. But plans to freeze wages, to eliminate seniority and tenure and collective bargaining, to decertify our union, to get rid of labor unions altogether, have nothing to do with improving schools or helping children. They have everything to do with silencing our collective voice, the voice of Minnesota's public school educators. But we will not be silenced, and I promise you here today, we will not be. From its very beginning, organized labor has stood up for the rights of everyday working people. Many of you know the story of my grandfather. His name was Patrick Corcoran. He wanted to be a teacher. He actually trained to be a teacher. But he became a milk truck driver instead when he found out the hours were shorter and the pay was better. <laughs> Not much different than today. He eventually became a union organizer and a leader in the Teamsters. One night in 1937, someone ambushed him outside his home in Minneapolis. They beat him, and they shot him in the head. The police investigated, but to this day, no one has ever been charged with his murder. My grandfather gave his life for the cause of better rights, better wages, and better working conditions for all people, not just those in labor unions. The people who killed him no doubt thought his death would stop the growing labor movement, but it didn't. It had the opposite effect. It pulled people together. The Teamsters in the city brought, brought the city to a standstill on the day of his funeral. In the summers that followed, they organized annual picnics to honor him and other victims who died fighting for organized labor. Those picnics became so large and so popular, the city leaders in Minneapolis organized a counter celebration to draw attention away from the memorials. We now call that counter-celebration the Minneapolis Aquatennial. My grandfather's first choice was to be a teacher, but history chose him for something larger, just as history now chooses us. We have no reason to fear for our lives the way he did, but we have every reason to fear for our livelihoods exactly as he did. We must protect our schools and our students from those who would dismantle public education in the name of reforming it. Because it has never been more clear than it is today. If we don't do it, no one else will. The state senator who wrote the pay freeze bill told me directly in his office that in his perfect world, our union would not exist two years from now. I hate to tell him, but his perfect world's not gonna happen in Minnesota. <laughs> the challenges we face are serious, and they are real. Overcoming them will not be easy, but nothing worth accomplishing ever is. Education Minnesota is addressing these challenges head on with an aggressive plan that we started developing last spring. Our plan involves significant changes in the way we communicate with the public, with our local leaders, and how they interact with lawmakers. And because there's so many new politicians at the Capitol, we reconfigured our legislative dinners to emphasize relationships first. We also made changes in our collective bargaining conference to emphasize the training of local contract action teams and to give locals new tools for dealing with this new landscape. 
We also started last fall on an aggressive, proactive legislative agenda developed by our members that we unveiled publicly in January. One element of that agenda is an annual performance review for educators. Our model would ensure meaningful, high-quality evaluations, evaluations based on fairness and professional development, not punishment and dismissal. Our model will emphasize that good teaching and good education cannot be defined simply by what fits inside the oval on a standardized test. We're working closely with the governor's office on that legislation. A bill that contains many of those elements was introduced two days ago. It's called House File 1173, and we'll be supporting its passage. We've also established weekly talking points for local presidents. We've expanded our media training so that all local leaders can better communicate our stories to the public. And we're taking a significant new approach with our ad campaign. You may have already seen them on TV or right here in the convention hall. The four commercials in this first phase of I Raise My Hand campaign are specifically designed to capitalize on three critical points. One, to reinforce that Minnesota educators are dedicated to only the best in our public schools. Two, to encourage every person in Minnesota to get involved in their schools, to accept their portion of the shared responsibility necessary to make our schools the best in the world. And third, to turn the public support for educators and public schools into action. It is important, that important element is often overlooked in the sea of negative news that seems to surround us these days. Remember this, students and parents admire and respect us more than any other public employee, elected or otherwise. Our polling shows that the vast majority of Minnesotans believe their public schools are doing a good or excellent job of teaching their children. That is extremely good news. Support for us and for public education runs very deep in this state. Despite the worst economy in our lifetimes, a significant majority of Minnesotans think our state should stop cutting education and start spending more money in our classrooms and on our campuses. And voters say they will harshly judge politicians who want to cut education funding. That's not a coincidence. The excellent work you do every day in the classroom, combined with our consistent ad campaign messages and our many other outreach efforts, have driven home that point. Education needs to be our state's top priority. The message is getting through. You can see it in the budget proposals from both the Republican-led legislature and Governor Dayton. Funding for K-12 education is shielded from some of the harsh cuts proposed in other parts of the budget. But we need to continue to draw attention to all the great things educators are doing in every district, in every corner of this great state. I was in Sabika, up in northern Minnesota last week. I was so impressed what I saw there. Every faculty member wears many hats. Every student is involved in something outside the classroom. This tiny school has enormous energy. Their school spirit is on full display this week because their girls are in the state high school basketball tournament. I witnessed a remarkably vibrant and engaged community that takes incredible pride in giving its children a robust, well-rounded education. You know what, sisters and brothers? The thing is, Sabika is not the exception. Sabika is the rule. Schools throughout Minnesota are filled with that kind of spirit. In the face of cuts and layoffs, in the face of critics who vilify and scapegoat educators, in the face of self-appointed reformers who don't know the sharp end of a pencil from the rubber end, we, we, brothers and sisters, are making education work. We are making it work in every classroom, in every school, in every community in our great state. And we can never, ever let anyone forget it. So before you leave the convention today, turn your support into action. Raise your hand for better schools in Minnesota. Follow the steps that Carl and Brandon outlined earlier. 
Make a commitment to take time to tell your story. Tell them to a friend, a neighbor, someone in your community. Write a letter to the local newspaper. Call your lawmaker. Send them a postcard. Urge them to visit your classroom. Encourage all of our fellow members to do that and more. Minnesota needs a positive vision for our future and the future of our students. In the last eight years, we have been conditioned to believe the only choices are between what to cut and by how much. Sisters and brothers, that is a false choice. Minnesota is better than that. Minnesota deserves a bigger, better, bolder vision for the future. Our vision for education should be that Minnesota becomes the first state in America to eliminate the achievement gap and make it a distant memory. We can do that by following research and focusing resources, not by signing on to the latest fad. Our vision should be that Minnesota colleges and universities are the most desired campuses in America and that higher education should be affordable again for every student who wants it. Our vision must be that teachers and educational support professionals and higher education faculty are respected, well-paid, and treated like the professionals that we are. We must have affordable health care when we get sick and a decent, decent pension when we retire. Our vision should be that this union of educators takes the lead in shaping education policy. As I've said to you already throughout this convention, all of the innovative ideas we need to improve education and to move our profession forward already exist in this room and in classrooms across Minnesota. Our vision should be that Minnesota stops thinking in terms of what Minnesota schools can do without and starts thinking in terms of what our students need to succeed. We had en we've had enough of the do more with less mentality. If Minnesota truly wants to provide a world-class education, then our state will recognize, as it did a generation ago, that we must invest our way to prosperity, not cut our way to mediocrity. <laughs> Fellow educators, I know you're weary. I know you're frustrated. It's March. Parent-teacher conferences, the weather's changing. Every teacher in America is weary and frustrated about now. But our optimism should rise with the temperature and our pessimism should melt with the snowbanks. Yes, there is plenty of challenging news out there, but there's plenty of inspirational news too. I'd like to finish today with a story about a young teacher I met recently in Warren, Minnesota, way up in the northwestern corner of the state. <laughs> Allison Geary teaches high school physics and chemistry and earth and physical science. If you visit Warren and talk to Allison, the first thing she's going to tell you about is how great her students are, how hard they work, how proud she is of them. If you visit Warren and talk to Allison, it won't take her long to also tell you there aren't enough desks for all of her students in her science class and that her kids deserve better. If you visit Warren and talk to anyone other than Allison, the first thing they're going to tell you about is Allison. It's because of her, because in addition to teaching physics and chemistry, earth and physical science, Allison also teaches life. Allison learned a couple of years ago she had breast cancer serious enough to require major surgery. But it turned out surgery wasn't enough. The cancer came back. So Allison underwent more treatment. And when school resumed last fall, there she was, back in front of her students. The rare day that she misses school are the days she drives a round trip 90 minutes to Grand Forks for chemo. She's too sick on those days. But usually, sisters and brothers, she's back in the class the very next day teaching her students about physics, chemistry, earth and physical science, and life. 
She gets through her days on grit, determination, and dedication to the students, the parents, and the citizens of the Warren Alvarado Oslo School District. The lessons that she teaches go far beyond filling in an oval on a standardized test. Like every teacher I've ever met, Allison doesn't consider herself a hero, which is exactly why she is one. So pardon me if I get a little worked up when so-called education reformers churn out their anti-public education, anti-teacher rhetoric, disguising it with slogans and packaging it in movies like Waiting for Superman. I've got news for them. Superman is already here, and her name is Allison. Allison. <laughs> And I know that Allison's grit, her determination, and her dedication live in educators all over this state. Teachers are not what ails education. Teachers are what's saving education. Right. Teachers like Allison, like every one of us in this room, pour their hearts and their souls and their very lives into the dedicated service for their students. Minnesota is one of the greatest places in the world to live because our educators, unionized, highly trained educators, taught and nurtured and challenged generation of students who grew up to be the foundation of our prosperity. Sisters and brothers, I am proud to be an educator. I am proud to be a union member, and I am proud to be your president. I vow to you today, I will not rest until all of our challenges are met, until our vision becomes a reality for the future. So sister, to our sisters and brothers in organized labor, to the men and women of working families, to the students and parents of public schools, to Allison Geary, to every other unsung hero in the state of Minnesota in every single classroom, all of those who sacrificed before us, we raise our hands. We, we pledge to stand with you and for you so that all of us can enjoy the brightest tomorrow we can build. Sisters and brothers, thank you very much. Let's carry on the fight. Solidarity. Thank you.